My name is Johnny Dario, and I'm the Executive Director of the Grillo Health Information Center. And I'm really excited to welcome you here tonight, and we're, we're all very lucky to be here. Um, you all have a seat, and that's great, because there are some others who might not be able to have a seat, and we can't have anybody standing in the, uh, along the aisles, because that's a fire regulation violation. There's a seat right here, too. There's a seat right here, and there's a couple of seats right in the middle. I want to thank Dave Fletcher, our sound and light man. He's in the back there. You really make this possible for us. Thank you so much, Dave. You've done this many times. And also Michael Kosikoff here in the front row. He's video recording this. This will be available um, in video so you can watch it and listen to it and tell your friends. It will be available on our website in about a week or two after this event. The Stahl Health Series is presented to you and sponsored by the Grillo Health Information Center. How many of you have been to a previous Stahl Health Lecture event? Good, good. And those of you who haven't, we hope to stimulate you and inspire you with, with cutting edge information. We have an exciting panel tonight and um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Grillo Center first. We're a nonprofit organization, been in Boulder County for over 16 years, served thousands of individuals and families, and we provide free health and medical information that we research um, through subscription databases. These databases are sponsored and provided by the National Institute of Health and the National Library of Medicine. These databases are updated with current medical information by 1,500 pieces of data and new articles every day. So it's the latest and greatest medical information. We don't give advice, but we give you, we guarantee that the information is current and evidence-based, it's science-based medical information for you to feel more empowered and your family members about making the right choices for your health care and your treatment options. We have over 25 volunteers. That's really the makeup of our organization. They're trained to do this research, and they work with you one-on-one, -on -one, confidentially, and uh, it's, it's really a, a great, tremendous service to the community. Any kind of health issue, condition that, um, that you may have or others have, we, we try to do the research on. It includes, um, it's on my second page, heart disease, bursitis, emphysema, diabetes, intestinal stuff, breast cancer, medication, from ingrown toenails to brain tumors to athletic performance and nutrition, any kind of health question at all, and we're happy to do the research for you. It takes, on average, over three hours to do the research, to have it reviewed for quality control, and to provide you with um, the information that will help you make a, a better, more informed decision about your health care and treatment. Did you know that not knowing what to do about your health care results in over $100 billion in unnecessary health care costs in the United States every year? Our little nonprofit, and that's a staggering figure that's provided by the National Institute of Health, and our nonprofit does its, um, has its impact in Boulder County to make a difference uh, in helping people to feel empowered, to be more educated, and to be self-sufficient in participating in their health care. My youngest sister was diagnosed with MS a few years ago, and my oldest sister was diagnosed with lymphoma. It was traumatic for us, it was very confusing and scary, and the Grillo Center was a tremendous resource for me and for my family. 97% of the people who use our services have rated our services as excellent. Of those who said that our research helped them make specific lifestyle changes, 100% of them said that these changes improved their health. How many of you have tried to find reliable health information online through the internet and became overwhelmed by the amount of information out there? It's, it's unbelievable out there. If you, if you Google, I, I Googled um, diabetes uh, not too long ago, and over 100 million resources popped up. And they don't tell you what's current. They don't tell you what's fact or fiction. It's really difficult to ascertain, and that's what we do for you, and we, um, we assure you that it's reliable, current, and evidence-based. We say to our community, don't Google. 
use Grillo. <laughs> we were formed, the Grillo Center was formed in 1998 and named after the late CU professor Virgil Grillo, as well as the Stahl Health Lectures, named after his colleague, the late Gary Stahl, both of whom were not satisfied with the lack of reliable information uh, that they were even seeking as educated men in our community. Uh, and this nonprofit is their legacy. And you are benefiting from it right now through, through the, this Stahl Health Lecture. I'd like to take a moment to ask Mitch Stahl, who is Gary Stahl's wife, an original founder of the Grillo Center and the Stahl Health Lecture Series, and board member is here in the audience. Would you mind standing, Mitch? Thank you so much for your support. And if any other board members, past and present, are here, Dan and others, if you would just raise your hand, just let folks know that good Melody and Van, thanks so much for being here. All of our services are free. I think that's pretty amazing. At our first Stahl Health Lecture, we asked our audience with a written evaluation um, if they would be willing to, if it would be appropriate to charge admission for these services. And the overwhelming response was yes, and their suggested um, admission price was 10 to $15. But we don't want to charge. We want these events, all of our services, to be free to you and to those who need it. But it's not free to us. It costs a lot. We rely on donations to exist. We have no endowment. We have no benefactor. Individual donations from folks like you are the lifeblood of our nonprofit organization. We want to keep our services free, including um, the hours of research, the tremendous effort to put on the health professional panel that we, that we are presenting to you tonight. Um, we spend so much time, effort, coordination, and passion putting our services together to, to serve this community. And we even have arranged the weather to accommodate you so you can be here tonight. And the roads. So we have influenced both heavenly and municipal that we work hard behind the scenes to make this successful. Where else can you get personal, confidential re, uh, resources like, like we provide? Health is the most important asset you have. Where else can you get a renowned panel of medical doctors and health professional experts willing to spend their time sharing their knowledge and expertise with you in a, in a format, in a forum like this? We obviously need your support. That's why we are passing around some baskets um, and hope that you would give something. Anything would be really appreciated. Your wallets, your car keys, your house keys, it just would really make a difference to helping us continue to provide these services. We also have pledge cards at the end of the tables when you leave. If you're inspired to take a pledge card with you and send us something in the mail, that would be really great. And we also have a donate button on our website, grillocenter.org. Uh, you could donate anonymously, it's secure. And you could donate in honor of someone or in memory of someone. And, and for those who, of you who are especially interested in an even smaller, more intimate setting where we share um, conversations and discussion about topics like this, um, I wanted to let you know that we're going to hold one on December 8th. It's going to be about preparing for dementia, organizing your health. And Dr. Rohini Kanaganti is going to be there. And I don't know if some of you hopefully remember her. She was the charismatic and compassionate um, speaker at many of our Stahl Health Lecture presentations. And um, she will uh, be available that day and participate with us, along with um, Dr. Eileen Naomi Rusk, who's on our panel tonight and leading the discussion tonight. This December 8th is a fundraiser. It's an annual Colorado Gives Day. Um, we'll have wine and hors d'oeuvres. There will be a minimum donation, and all proceeds will support the work of the Grillo Center and the Stahl Health Lecture Series. Thank you so much for your patience getting me getting through this. I want to really welcome you and uh, honor, it's my honor to introduce this panel and a member of our board of directors and the coordinator of this innovative event who is responsible for inspiring this topic and arranging these speakers, Dr. Eileen Naomi Rusk. Thank you.
and over 14 million Americans are going to be affected by it 2050. One of our goals tonight is to alleviate some of our fear, and to do this first we're going to acknowledge it. At least I'll acknowledge mine. Another goal for us tonight is to inspire some curiosity and to not feel alone. A wish of mine is that together we consider what really happens, and this became a very key piece for me as I was preparing this panel. A wish of mine is that together we consider what really happens when memory unravels in us and when we no longer know ourselves as we were and we no longer know the other as they were either. Who is that enduring me? I started in this field almost 30 years ago, and I was mostly focused upon small little neurotransmitters. I was a neuropsychopharmacologist, and my research focus was very narrow, and I looked at specific receptors and neurotransmitter systems in the brain. And my goal was to target chemicals, which might be the key to some great discovery. I also worked with pharmaceutical companies. I then trained in neuropsychology and focused upon the subtleties of the different dementias and what they look like in the different neurodegenerative diseases. It's been both heartening and frustrating to see what's happened since then. I bet you're all thinking, oh, she doesn't look that old. <laughs> But it has been both, both heartening and frustrating to see what's happened since then. Frustrating because the medical profession and drug companies are often still focusing upon these tiny targets, tiny targets in the brain, in particular pharmacologic or biologic microscopic agents. Some reports suggest that $85 billion has already been spent on looking for treatments and for cures. As I speak now, we have no medicine which modifies the course of Alzheimer's disease. We do have several cognitive enhancers, and hopefully some of the exciting new studies in, in genetics and predispositions will help us find more targeted strategies. As of now, nothing. What's been heartening for me, though, over the same time period, is that scientists and clinicians are looking at all of these other really exciting things which may be protective and help delay the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Scientists are even using the word prevention at some very big, notable universities and hospitals. Prevention. I like that. There's so much data now on the protective effects of exercise, increasing neurotrophic factors in the brain, growth factors, and on mindfulness. Mindfulness practices puffing up our anterior cingulate cortex and our hippocampus. Mindfulness also orients our focus to the present moment, which is really what we need when memory recoils and our ability to imagine the future fades. The research on nutrition, how our bodies and brains metabolize things, is cutting edge right now. Alzheimer's disease is also related to heart health, diabetes, our genetic profile. Another heartening focus is on the healing benefits of cognitive stimulation. I bet many of you have heard of this. Cognitive stimulation, music, social engagement. There's even great data showing that music training may have a neuroprotective effect in aging brains. And let's not forget our precious sleep, during which we're clearing away toxins and even amyloid from our brains with the newly found lymphatic system, like the lymphatic system in the body, but the lymphatic system in the brain. So the good news with all of this is that neuropharmacologists and biologists are still doing what they do best, thank goodness, looking for targeted and honed treatment strategies, but it's great that we also have other researchers, other researchers 
looking for alternatives and more integrated and personalized treatment approaches. So let's talk about dementia in general. Since I'm doing the landscape, the World Health Organization defines it as a chronic progressive syndrome in which there is a deterioration in memory, thinking, behavior, and ability to perform everyday activities. So sure, and I, I really feel like Sometimes we don't realize this. It does involve memory often, but not always initially. But it can also include impairments in visual spatial function, judgment, executive functions, speech and language challenges. Dementia is usually accompanied by what's often harshest or most challenging, emotional discontrol or social behavior changes. The humbling fact is, and I pause when I say this, it affects each person in a very, very different way. And we have to be fluid and flexible in our expectations and our understanding. Which brings me back to the balm of mindfulness and presence. A host of neurodegenerative diseases cause dementia, like cerebrovascular disease, frontotemporal dementias, Lewy body disease, Huntington's disease, and that's just to name a few, and maybe Dr. Zona will speak to some others, but um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. In 1901, Alois Alzheimer discovered this pathology, but he's also credited with something else that's really important, which I hadn't realized until I read for this talk. He kind of made it clear that Dementia is not necessarily a symptom of aging. It's often associated with aging, but it's not just a phenomenon associated with aging. It accounts for, Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 70% of all the dementias. And it's diagnosed, shockingly, every 68 seconds. One in 10 people over the age of 65 will have or have dementia of the Alzheimer type. And about 30% of people over 85 will have dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And curiously to me, and this is one of my, I don't know what you call pet peeve, pet subjects, it curiously, two thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women. And Megan probably sees this too. So why? So many theories about this. Is it estrogen? Is it progesterone? Is it, uh, scientists are saying now that it's not just because women live longer, and that's an issue of thought, it's kind of a myth. No, what else could be putting women at greater risk? Biological differences in how women age, lifestyle factors, maybe how women react to stress. These are just theories, and some of them are my theories. There are other theories like early menopause or late menopause. But one worrisome clue is that research shows that a notorious Alzheimer's related gene may indeed have a bigger impact upon women than men. Curious. So Alzheimer's brains are shriveled with beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles being prominent features. Not necessarily causal, but features. And I just talked to Dr. Zona about this. Plaques are usually found inside the neurons. And tangles are usually found, no, plaques are actually outside the neurons accumulating, but it's the tangles that are usually found in the neurons themselves. By the way, I recently heard a well-known neurologist say that when it comes to brain health, size matters. And Alzheimer's brains indeed do shrink. So the news is that research shows that these plaques are present in our brains long before we're symptomatic. And why might that be good news? And I say it in a very humble or sober, guarded way. Because there's a window where plaques are growing, or pathology might be growing, but people are still cognitively clear. So maybe that's the window where we can do some intervention. Or maybe at least it's a marker. I'll call it the window of hope right now. Right? And that's where some of the research attention is actually going. And that's the good news. Guarded, but good. So we have Alzheimer's disease, some good news about lifestyle type treatments, 
and a possible window of opportunity for intervention. We're going to talk about all these things tonight, from brain health to pharmaceuticals to metabolism to personalized treatments, maybe even some information on genes, not my area of strength, to some mindful and conscious caregiving. We'll start with a short video. It's a, a national still on aging short video on the, some of the mechanisms involved in the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And I thought it might be interesting for you. It's just four minutes, and I hope you really like it. So we'll turn the lights down and see this very small NIH, NIA video. <coughs> Thank you. 
very good animation and uh, describe what happened on a, what happens on a cellular level. Um, I want to introduce now Dr. Michael Zona to you. Dr. Zona is a psychiatrist here in Colorado, and he is indeed one of the finest psychiatrists I know. He is board certified in so many things, I'll just tell you a few of them. He's board certified in psychiatry and neurology. He, has, he actually has additional board certification in geriatric psychiatry and uh, some, uh, some aspect of forensic psychiatry, forensic psychiatry and medicine. And he has a very long and esteemed academic and clinical career. Please welcome uh, Dr. Michael Zona. Thank you. Can you all hear me without this? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. How about this? Better. Better. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Rusk. I, I appreciate your invitation for me to visit here to see me. When um, 30 years ago, when I was in medical school and residency, we were told that dementia was this um, slow, progressive, stable neuronal degeneration. And there was no treatment for it. Over time, however, we found out that there are some, some treatments. And we'll talk a little bit about how those treatments work in, in a couple of minutes. My love and was and still still now is, is geriatric psychiatry. And um, I love the fact that people have had a full life and many times for no fault of their own, they're not suffering some degenerative disease that takes away their soul. And um, so I've, I really am passionate about, about treating dementia and um, have uh, probably, when I was in Orange County, California, rotated through and saw patients at about 80 different nursing homes and long-term care facilities. These are folks who find it very difficult to get treatment, find it very difficult to get good treatment, and language without proper care. Um, I've also worked for 20 years, uh, starting three different inpatient general psych facilities in Los Angeles and Orange County, and pretty much uh, was doing full-time geriatric for about 20 years. Now I have a private practice here in Boulder, and it's, I would say my geriatric um, patient load is about 10%, so it's a lot less now. Uh, so this was an opportunity for me to um, delve back into the research and see what's happened over the last three or four years and, and uh, bone up on it again. Um, I remember rounding through nursing homes and, and uh, contrary to what I was taught, I found dementia to be very vibrant and very uh, variable. You could have somebody who didn't know your name, didn't remember their nurse's name, even though they lived at the nursing home for the last five years, had the same nurse, you know, full time days, kept forgetting the name, and so on and so forth. Then one day I'd be rounding, and all of a sudden they, they knew their name, they knew their wife's name, they could tell you telephone numbers, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is a lot different than what I was told dementia was, which was this slow, stable disorder. In fact, people with Dementia show good days and bad days. And a lot of people don't appreciate that. And um, oftentimes when I found a patient who was having a really good day, I'd get on the phone call a family member and say, hey, come see your dad because he's really good today. And he's going to know you and he's, he's conversing fully. This is, a, this is an opportunity. So they would come in and we'd be at the bedside talking and so on, yucking it up. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, so, um, there are several different kinds of dementias. Dr. Rusk had said that uh, Alzheimer's is about 70%, but we also know that there is a Parkinson's dementia complex. When Lois uh, Parkinson described Parkinson's disease, he named it after himself, uh, he said that it did not involve neuronal degeneration, but in fact, now that people are living longer, we've seen that it does. There is also a frontal lobe dementia type. There is um, Willy body dementia. But the fact is, is that it, you know, in, in the world, there's, 
there's lumpers and there's splitters. I, I have a tendency to, to split and say, hey, this is different kinds of things. Just like I've always thought schizophrenia was several different diseases that manifested itself in one con constellation of symptoms. The same thing is true with dementia. Dementia is several diseases. I wouldn't be surprised if there were 20 to 40 different kinds of diseases that create dementia. That same kind of constellation that Dr. Russ was talking about, the same end point. Um, so, the bad news is that treatment to date is, has been pretty horrible. The kinds of treatments that were coming out about 15 to 20 years ago haven't been advanced all that much. Research is um, fast and furious, but it comes, uh, it comes in fits and starts. Basically, there is no cure on the horizon for dementia. Uh, and hopefully, over time, as these things become elucidated and the, and the pathogenesis, the way cells die, start to get teased out, we can say, oh, this is like Alzheimer's type 3B. This, this will respond to this kind of treatment and so on. We'll, we'll have a better sense. But right now, uh, what we call Alzheimer's, my thinking is it's probably 20 different diseases, genetic and environmental, that, that are all adding to that wastebasket diagnosis called Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, treatments. I think what I'll do is talk a little bit about treatments and then um, we can talk about some of the newer research and then some conclusions. Um, one of the things with, hey, have you all heard of Parkinson's disease? Yeah. Show of hands, right? Okay, so one of the things with um, Parkinson's disease is you have cells that are dying. And these particular cells make, make a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Okay? Well, how do you get this nerve to talk to this nerve. It turns out that they talk to each other by releasing neurotransmitters. And in Parkinson's disease, what they release is dopamine. So, there's a good way to say, oh, well, we can just give patients dopamine who are having Parkinson's because their, their, their cells are dying off. If you give them dopamine, it doesn't matter what dies off. This cell will still get spoken to with the extra. Well, you can't get dopamine because it doesn't absorb from the brain what matters. So what you do is you give L-dopa, which is a precursor to dopamine, and then patients, people who take L-dopa and various combinations, they actually can do much better. Now, with Alzheimer's, it's not dopamine, but it's acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is released, and this cell talks to this cell. And with Parkinson's disease, the essential feature of that disorder is it's a movement disorder. Early stages. Later stages, you can get a dementia complex with it. But this is a movement disorder. When acetylcholine is released to a different cell, we saw those beautiful pictures on that video there, what you have here is thinking. Okay? And that's memory, that's recall, that's visual, spatial. How do I get to the bathroom from my bedroom? How do I get to the library from uh, North Boulder? And so on and so forth. So, acetylcholine comes here and it results in thinking. Well, we cannot do any kind of front loading like we can with dopamine by giving L dopamine. Instead, there's an infrastructure. What we can do is, the cells that are still alive, we can prevent the acetylcholine from breaking down. So here you don't prevent the dopamine from breaking down. You just front load it and you get a whole bunch of extra. Over here, with acetylcholine, what we do is we, we use something that keeps the acetylcholine around longer. Now, acetylcholine, when it's released, gets broken up to two components. I'll just call them X and Y. 
If we could invent an enzyme that could be absorbed into the brain through the brain blood barrier, take a desert pill or a gel, a um, um, injection, there's a lot of different ways to, to give medications, and it can be transported through the brain blood barrier and prevent acetylcholine from breaking down, then you can actually treat Alzheimer's by enhancing thinking like this. Okay? Well, that's what is involved with one big class of compounds for treating Alzheimer's disease. The thing that breaks these, the acetylcholine down is called acetylcholinesterase. The, the treatments are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So we're preventing the breakdown here by getting these medications. The medications don't work very well at all. In fact, they don't even reverse dementia. If you were to look at a longitudinal course, let's say this is 100% thinking, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to measure this long term, short term. Um, attention, focus, because there's tons of ways of doing this, but for pur these purposes, we'll just say thinking. And if you look at year one, two, three, four, with your typical dementia, like an Alzheimer's type dementia, this is 100% here, what you'll have is a slow and progressive decline. Now, if you take the medication, what you can do is you can move this decline by about one year, stable. But then after that, the decline continues. So the medication is very, very poor. It does have um, some efficacy with mild to moderate dementia. But the medication that, that allows the acetylcholine to stick around longer is not all that effective. In fact, the moment you stop the medication, you go right back down to this slide. So let's say you're here, and you say, okay, medication is too expensive. I'm not going to take it anymore. I have side effects to it. You immediately will degrade back to your original cognitive decline course. So the medications are really quite poor, in my opinion. And there, there's no quick and dirty, beautiful treatment for dementia. All you can do really is modulate the course of the disease minimally. How horrible is that? It's a pretty bad, bad situation. Uh, okay. There's another medication out there called Memenda. That works in a different way, but what it does is it prevents cells from dying. And that works on uh, the glutamate system, not the acetylcholine system. But these medications are very poor. They don't work all that well. They do have side effects. Um, it's very frustrating to offer these to patients and see minimal improvement. And you just throw up your hands and say, I'm sorry, this is the best we can do. Um, so because of that, really what we have to do is look at earlier treatments. If you feel or you know somebody who's losing their memory and they come into treatment earlier, which is the case now that I'm seeing, Back in the day, people would only come into treatment when they were, had moderate Alzheimer's. Now people are starting to recognize that some of the stigma has gone away and coming in and saying, hey, I need help. Please help me. So some of this is, is being done. But what you want to do is, is it's great to have people early because when you have people early, you can do lots of different things to try to modulate the situation. The new research being done now is on this beta amyloid what they showed there, okay, the, the picture of the cell protein and how it causes cell death and so on. Basically, it's a balance between you have this amyloid precursor, it can go one of two ways, the alpha or the beta. Beta is toxic. So all the research now is on trying to shift the molecular functioning over to the proper alpha protein, so you don't have the cell death that's occurring with the beta. The beta is implicated in the neurofibular tangles and also in the uh, tau proteins that, that they show along, along inside the cell. If this 
is a cell, this is a cell. This is the neural fibular entangles. They're between the cells. And then here you have the tau, the tau proteins um, here. Last. <laughs> it's very hard with this microphone. It takes away my hand. Um, we don't even know if this stuff is really the, the cause of the disease. It could very well be. Like if you look at somebody who's had a stroke and they have flexion contractions, or they have spasticity, or they have uh, atrophy of their muscles. You can't say the stroke causes atrophy. The atrophy is a side effect of not being able to innervate that muscle. These things could also be just side effects of something way further upstream. And, and all of this could be basically uh, false research in many ways. It could be something a lot more critical, a lot more molecular, way upstream than the observations that we have right here. So at, at this point, Nobody really knows, but we do know some things that can help prevent dementia, including Alzheimer's. One is the diet. There is much higher incidence of folks with diabetes who have dementia. Dr. Russ uh, talked about women having a higher incidence of, of dementia and maybe estrogen is related to it. Not sure, the Women's Health Initiative, I think it's 57,000 patients entered it, um, had equivocal results of whether estrogen was responsible at all. Um, stress is very important. High cortisol levels, managing stress using meditation or mindfulness helps reduce um, brain toxicity. Exercise helps immensely because it increases your cerebral circulation, increases neurogenesis, increases a hormone in the brain called brain-derived neurotropic factor, which actually causes brain growth. You want to get that enhanced as much as you can. Keeping your homocysteine level, which is a sign of cell toxicity, under 7. Uh, looking at your D3 levels, your folate, your B12, Hemoglobin A1C, which is an indicator of how bad your diabetes is. Estrogen, we talked about. Probiotics. And also, serotonergic reuptake inhibitors like Celexa, Lexapro, have been shown to be effective. They actually shift the, uh, this amyloid precursor protein to make more of the alpha and less of the beta. And they show that response in one day, which is pretty amazing. So there's some new research in that. I just want to talk about one final um, study. This is about uh, three weeks old. It's from the University, University of Madrid. If you, if you read scientific literature, you start to see that a lot of things are caused by infections. This particular study uh, was on 25 cadavers. 14 had Alzheimer's. Of the 14, every single one had fungus culture from their brains. Of the remaining 11 that did not have Alzheimer's, no fungus was cultured from their brains. So there could be something there. Now, does that mean that because the brain is degenerating, it becomes more susceptible to fungus, and that's just a, a, a trivial Notice, or is, or is fungus or infection somehow involved in the treatment of Alzheimer's? Uh, right now, we don't know. Research is going on with billions of dollars, maybe millions, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on research. But it, essentially, we've had this problem now for decades, and we're essentially no better at figuring out how to treat it than we were 30 years ago. The only suggestions and recommendations I have is to look at preventing Alzheimer's from happening by taking care of yourself with exercise and all the other issues we talked about. Um, I'm sorry, it's hard to get all the data in, uh, in 15 minutes, but thank you.
great. Oh my goodness. We'll have time for questions after. So many questions. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Stephen Schmitz. He's a neuropsychologist and an expert in the field of traumatic brain injury, forensic neuropsychology, sports concussion, and his current clinical and research interests are now focused upon the emerging fields of personalized and combination interventions for people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. He's the director of the Brain and Behavior Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Schmitz. Thanks very much. Um, boy, those are great talks. Uh, this is inspiring. Um, when Johnny first uh, sent me an email about what to talk about, he said, we invite you to talk about cutting edge research. What's, what's really out there? It just so happened that a number of months ago, before I had been invited to talk here, I had signed up for the scientific symposium held by the Alzheimer's Organization of Colorado that happened to take place last week. So as I started to prepare for this talk, I thought, this is perfect. I'm going to find out what the cutting edge research is about Alzheimer's disease, because I'm already signed up for these talks. And I went there last week. And uh, I focused the emphasis of my uh, um, conferences that I was attending within that uh, larger conference were on early Alzheimer's treatment. By the way, uh, we, we classify people's function as normal and then what's called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment, where you know something's wrong, but no one can tell. And we can test you and we can't find that you score that much differently. After SCI comes MCI, mild cognitive impairment, where there is something definitely wrong and we can tell and it's affecting your daily functioning. And then early Alzheimer's disease, and then three stages of Alzheimer's early, better than later. So I went to these talks, and I listened to half a dozen speakers talking about drug therapies, just what Dr. Zona was talking about, and inviting people to participate in drug trials. And I came to realize that in the decade between 2002 and 2012, this is not going to be surprising to you, there were 244 drug trials for Alzheimer's disease. And out of those 244, one medication um, had a mild uh, a positive outcome, and that was the uh, amendment that uh, I just talked about. This is exemplary of how we think. If we can find a magic bullet that will solve our problem, we want to find it. And thank goodness we're trying to do that. But what we've known is that, who knows about Dean Ornish, right? Heart guy? 30 years ago, what did he say if you want to have a healthy heart? Anyone, what did he say? What's that? Low fat. Low fat? What else did he say? Meditate. Exercise. Exercise. Play bingo once a support. Play bingo once a support. And have support. Right. And so, this monotherapy approach, while good and valuable, a lot of money's going to it, has intrigued some researchers. And one researcher it happened to intrigue that I found out about was a guy who published an article in AG Magazine in September 2012, or 2014, last year, a year ago, 12 months ago, 14 months ago. His name is Dale Bredesen. Uh, I brought the uh, the citation here, uh, some, I've got some of uh, the abstract here if you want to have a copy at the end of my talk if you're interested. And Dr. Bredesen felt that this monotherapeutic approach was not what we should be doing. We should be doing a combination approach that looks at all of the things that we know are implicated in brain health. That 
both Eileen and Michael have already talked about and that you already know about. Health, diet, exercise, nutrition, sleep, um, social engagement, relaxation, mood, as well as hormonal levels, metabolism, uh, uh, metabolites, uh, uh, um, and all of the other neurochemical processes that underlie good functioning. So Bredesen developed a program to look at that, and he found ten subjects. Nine of them had SCI or, SCI or MCI, or early Alzheimer's, and one of them was in later stage Alzheimer's. Uh, he took those subjects, six of the ten of the early stage people had had to recently quit their jobs or were having trouble in their jobs because of their disease process. And yet they were still functioning, they were still working, or they were on their way out of their jobs. And he found them, got them into the program, and put them on a very structured regimen that looked at all of these different aspects of brain health. And he gave them a specialized regimen. He started with looking at their genetic structure. He analyzed that. He looked at their blood. He did a, a comprehensive analysis of their blood. And he also looked at uh, their behavioral function. And then he created a personalized protocol for each one of those subjects that included medications, could have been insulin, could have been um, uh, hormone, hormonal uh, uh, supplements. Uh, it depended upon the individual and not as a class, but specifically what was going on with that person's blood workup and genetic makeup. He gave them a prescription for their diet. Uh, by the way, there's a new book out called The Alzheimer's Diet, which is uh, kind of a step uh, um, forward from the Mediterranean diet. You know about these diets, right? You know what's, we all know what's good for you, right? Low glycemic, right? Low carbohydrate, you know about these things. He put that together for them. He looked at their sleep and he said, For your sleep, you need to get at least eight hours of sleep a night. Eileen talked about the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system, which is a cleansing system we've just come to realize uh, exists and that it's necessary to have at least eight hours of sleep a night to have that cleansing take place. Uh, he prescribed for them that they were not to eat for three hours before they go to sleep. That diet, any recommended dieting on a regular once every three, three month basis. Uh, because uh, when you are not uh, having this cleansing process, toxins can build up, which is what Dr. Zona talked about. And those kinds of toxins, we think, can be on the path of a precursor toward some type of dementia. And he talked about not eating for 12 hours between your last meal and your next meal at night. Uh, he put them on an exercise regimen. Uh, he put them on a meditation regimen. Some of them got involved with yoga. Some of them did individual meditation. Um, he created a physical exercise regimen for each one of us. We know that our research is showing that exercise definitely impacts brain health. And stretching is not enough. We need to have heart rate buildup. Walking is not enough. 
good, but it's not enough. So, Dr. Bredesen put these subjects through this program. And nine out of those ten subjects, the ones that were early in the stage, all showed improvement. The six of them that had had to stop working or on the, on the way of stopping working were able to go back to work. And two and a half years later, the ones that had come back to work stayed back at work. The tenth subject was one who was in the later stages and did not show any improvement. So again, earlier is better to start doing this. Uh, this is a pilot study from a science-based, research-based perspective. It is just interesting. It does not rise to the level of uh, um, research-based studies. But it is very interesting. And it is cutting edge. And it, the, as a pilot study, it was quite involved in the success rate that it had. So here's what Dr. Medicine thinks. He thinks that by prescribing all these supplements and medications that are specific for you based on your genetic makeup and your blood workup, and by prescribing and changing your behavioral structures and your habits, that any one of those individually may not be of any real significance in a scientific study. If we just took ginkgo and we studied it and we said, well, the research on ginkgo really shows that it doesn't really help. But what Bredesen says is that maybe in combination a little bit of ginkgo here, a little bit of salt here, a little bit of pepper there, a little bit of, of uh, insulin here. This kind of combination may serve to create a result that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So, that's what I've got to tell you about the latest in uh, Alzheimer's treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schitz. Very compelling. Megan, Megan Carnarius is a very beloved nurse and specialist working with people with dementia and their families. She's authored an incredibly needed and well-received book entitled A Deeper Perspective on Alzheimer's and Other Dementias. I specifically called her today to ask her to bring with you. She offers her wisdom and her humor with practical tools and spiritual insights as well. She's executive director for Balfour Cherrywood Village, which is a memory care facility in Louisville. Lucky them. Please welcome Megan, who's going to ground us in how important it is to focus on emotional and spiritual attunement in working with people. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. I want everybody in the room to take a really deep breath. And I want you to focus on being well, even though you're getting all this information. And I want you to think about your being as well as your doing. And Alzheimer's heightens awareness around that in extraordinary ways. When you're a caregiver for someone who has memory loss, you become so sensitive to how the brain is working and the good and bad days that we heard about earlier. Um, and then how do you respond to that? How do you work with that? And we're going to focus more in my part of this also on earlier stage. Um, but I want to give a little history. Um, I've also been involved in this field about 30 years now, and the research and wishing the research would get further 
I was at um, a national Alzheimer's conference in 1990, and we had scientists projecting five to 15 years, and here we are. I was at the International Alzheimer's Conference in Washington, D.C. in 2000, and there was the same wish. Um, and so it is a big complex of things that are going on in the brain. And there's families that experience only one person having it and everyone else being okay. There are other families that see generations affected after generation. And I have been in Boulder for a long time, and I'm actually now getting inquiries from the children I had worked with. They had had their parents that I was caring for, and now those individuals' children are contacting me about them, and I'm helping families take care of them. So it's, it's huge, the impact. And also, everyone wants to do the right thing. You want to make the right choices, you want to support your health, and different things happen with research. And so estrogen was a really good example. Um, when I started working with people in the, in the early 90s, every woman on the unit was being prescribed estrogen. And then suddenly, the phone started ringing one day, and everybody was being taken off of estrogen. And basically, every single woman was taken off within three days because there had been a research study release saying, this isn't necessarily good, let's not do that. So it also can be confusing. And so when you think about the suggestions about what makes your quality of life better anyway, whether we avoid getting Alzheimer's or not, some of the suggestions are really grounded and positive and affect your daily life. So having an area where you can be more contemplative or feel at peace, um, looking at diet and saying, I want to do this out of a positive um, reason and not, you know, slapping myself around and saying I have to stop eating sugar, but what is it that helps me feel more steady and balanced? And so how can we support each other? And one of the things with Dean Ornish when he was working was he helped people form small groups where they supported each other with all these efforts because it was hard for people to change behavior and change their diet and change their exercise. But when they had other people that were interested in doing that, I think about a lot of people who have walking buddies or people they run into at the gym that they feel comfortable with. and It helps inspire them. It helps them show up. So how can we support each other in that? Another thing that's changed is people used to say the victim with Alzheimer's. And then it shifted to the person with Alzheimer's. And people with memory loss actually change long-term care. And so even though we all want to avoid being cared for in such places, those places have really changed over the last 30 years to really focus on what's called person-centered care. Trying to know people's stories and responding to what are their interests, how can we maximize those kinds of things, how can we bring structure to the day. So like in a memory care unit, we try to keep things really busy and a feeling of product productivity, but it's in a different way. It's also allowing focus, and, and attention, and then allowing relaxation so that you're not being demanding, but you're making sure that there are things available to do and that people can channel their energy. And I think also about um, aging, that Alzheimer's is part of aging in terms of people's vulnerability increases as they age. So if you're over the age of 85, there's a higher risk factor. And what are people looking at in their lives as they age how do I want to simplify things? How do I want to resolve issues that I've had in my life? What do I need to think about as I'm transitioning to the end of my life? And that Alzheimer's exaggerates that. And people are still working on those things when they start getting this diagnosis and start processing things. And so I look at that and say, I've worked with all these people and what is it teaching me? Anyone who comes towards me that has this disease, I feel like I should be learning something from that as much as, and I feel like they teach me much more than what I do for them. And so in that, what is it that I need to hold on to? Um, my mother had a, a, a severe stroke after surgery. She had a blood clot in her neck and she was 63. And she went through all kinds of traumatizing things. And at one point she was dropped from a Hoyer lift from its highest point on her head. And she was in a semi-somnolent state for about nine months. 
And it was really challenging for me as a long distance caregiver. Every time I came home, I was trying to figure out how can I help her? How can I stimulate her? What do I need to do to take care of her? And my mother was a very deeply spiritually connected person. She, was, she had a lot of resource in herself. And she would look at me and I'd be like, Mom, you need to get up, you need, you need to eat. And she would look at me and say, I just need to sleep. And so, okay, I'll let you sleep. And then you would, you know, it's another meal, you're supposed to, I just need to sleep. And over the months, she slowly started healing. And then she came totally back, all of her faculties in terms of, I mean, she still had her stroke, but in terms of her presence, and she said, I was working on my forgivenesses. In this deep level, it was as if I was given the opportunity of what I would expect would happen when I cross over, that I would get to life review and really deeply visit all the things that had happened, but instead I was still connected to this life, and but I was really busy, and actually, it was the most productive time I've had. And from the outside, it looked like the least productive time. So that was really interesting. And she ended up giving a talk to about 300 people at a, a group that she used to speak to. And it was, it was so dear that she had that opportunity. And she called it um, preparing for a life transition, meaning preparing for death. And what are the things that we need to tidy up, you know, tie up, let go of, figure out? And I feel like that's something that's valuable for anyone to do. And when people have Alzheimer's, it intensifies that because they harvest long-term memory, their short-term memory isn't as available, and they struggle to call up what just happened, they tend to live more in the spaces from the brain of what happened five years ago, what happened 15 years ago, what happened 30 years ago? And then they project it on what's going on around them, and we end up processing things that may, they may be harvesting from 60 years ago. And so it can be a really fruitful time. So that's later in the disease, and when you're at the beginning, you're having the basic struggle around my ego force, my personality, the way I identified it, functioned a certain way. And Alzheimer's makes that falter. You're, you're used to an assumption level and an ability to function that you've always been used to. And it gets interrupted. There's gaps. You try to do things, and sometimes it works really well, and sometimes it doesn't. And that rising frustration can be really difficult. And so also talking to those you love or people that you share your life with about as we go forward with this, I'm. I need to feel some level of autonomy. I need to feel like big important decisions I got to talk about. End of life planning, estate planning, all those things. If there's opportunities to talk about it before you can't. And the same thing about loving and expressing love. You know, people start having trouble with word finding. And then there's a the point where people can't speak. And so for me, in the early stages, we should really be maximizing our conversational abilities and figuring out how to discuss those things. Another thing that's wonderful is there's cities that are, that are working on becoming dementia-friendly. There's a village in Holland that was built that has housing and storefronts and bars and gyms that the public uses. And everyone who works there understands when people come in and out that they're going to be encountering people that might have a little challenge, and if the woman at the grocery store buys six loaves of bread, we'll figure out how to get it back to the store. It's okay. And this tolerance of some people have challenges, and that there's emotional things that we can still access really clearly. We are still really emotional, even though our cognition might be affected, and, and our soul is busy working on things, that we don't always know what the purpose of it is. And where is that experience going? And we tend to be judgmental about my intellectual capacity, my productivity, how I'm contributing in the world. And there, there's a gentling that has to happen and a shift as people get into early stage memory loss of where do I live in myself? 
and this thing of not judging in the same way. So it's really a step into unconditional love for oneself and for the other when you're working with someone that has memory loss. You, you begin being less judgmental about things that happen. Um, but it's hard. It's really hard. It's not an easy journey at all, so I don't want to minimize that. And I always want to say everyone's trying as hard as they can. And when we know that, then we know people aren't meaning to be difficult. <laughs> You're not meaning to get frustrated, but the emotion is really there. And we're all emotional beings, so that continues throughout the disease process and trying to figure out how to bridge and, and make connection. So I don't know if I've used up all my time. I'm okay. Do I have like one minute, I have one minute left? Yep, two. What did I do with two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other thing that just has informed my life experience was I had um, I had a handicapped younger sister, and when our family um, was working with that situation, our my parents actually had a meeting with my sister and I, my older sister and I, and said. There's an intention about why we're all together. And the tragedy would be missing the point of that. And so your sister is having a handicapping experience, but she's a whole spirit. And our job is to try to figure out how to help her shine through. I can't think of a more perfect spot to stop on. Why? Because even through the science, all of us were holding what Meg described as the whole spirit and the whole soul. Disguised as it may be with cognitive challenges or emotional challenges. So I really want to thank our speakers and